Hello again, friends. Thanks for coming back. It's been a couple of weeks. I did a video on the Blue Avian, that cute blue bus that was converted by a professional conversion company down in San Antonio, Texas, the Lone Star State. And in the time since I had a chance to look over that bus and bring it up here to our storage lot near Flagstaff, Arizona, I have since seen two other buses. I agreed for the owners of this bus to fly down to Texas and bring this one back here to our lot so I can make it electrically safe. Again, we're donating the time on that. And in fact, we've made some YouTube money off the other video that we're donating towards the parts to make these things electrically safe. Uh, but this bus, I'll do a full walk around. I'll show you everything that you want to not do uh, on your own conversion. And I can guarantee you that your conversion is going to be better quality than this piece of crap done by what is a professional company. I want to address a couple things here. A uh, lot of comments, most, like 90% of the comments in the first Blue Bus video were really supportive. But every now and then somebody would say, hey, why did the owners take the bus like that? Why didn't they refuse it? Well, what happened is that was a conversion for which they paid a 75% deposit. It was supposed to be a six to eight week build. After 14 months and after spending time being local, waiting for their bus to get done, finally they just took it without paying the additional 25%. That doesn't excuse the builder from you know, not having a full build. I mean, that 25% just really covered some final details. Uh, that doesn't excuse any of the poor electrical work or anything like that that was done on the build. But the customers, I think after 14 months, were rightfully very frustrated and wanted to take their bus. What about this one? This was a $100,000 high-end conversion. The company told them this is a high-end build for $100,000. So they paid $75,000 as a deposit, ended up staying in a hotel, and I think they ended up in an apartment for a while. They were in San Antonio so long waiting for this bus to get done. Finally, they had to give up. They just pulled the bus out of there. They took it to a vehicle wrap shop that was going to do a wrap job on it for them. The wrap company was unable to make the exterior look suitable, nice enough to be able to wrap it in a way that they could be proud of the end product. So this bus has been sitting at the wrap business out of the kindness of their heart uh, until I went down and picked it up here last week in San Antonio. So I flew to San Antonio, picked up this bus at the wrap place. I did stop uh, briefly and look at another bus that had some solar work done by the same place in San Antonio. A cute conversion done professionally up near Seattle and the owners of that bus just contracted because they live in Texas. They contracted with this place in San Antonio to add some solar. Well, guess what? The solar didn't work and it was not safe. They added a battery bank, uh, five additional lithium ion batteries. They didn't fuse the battery bank. They used the wrong size wire. They put the solar panel wiring in backwards. They actually, uh, well, I'll, we'll do a little segue uh, cutaway video of that. Uh, and how poorly those solar panels were installed on the roof of that thing. And then we'll come back and do the full walk around here. But anyway, I explain why. So when you say, hey, why did the customers accept this? By then they're just getting their bus. They've already paid a ton of money. And in fact, their dream of traveling around and spending their time together uh, in this high-end conversion is shot. They can't use it, it's not functional and you'll see why as we go through. It's not electrically safe. The plumbing's not done right. If they'd used the toilet, the urine would have just come out on the floor. Uh, so much amazing poor quality work in this thing that they finally just went and financed an RV and they're in the RV right now. And we are donating time and some materials to try to make this at least electrically safe so that hopefully they can sell it and recoup a little bit of money. Yes, these customers are working with an attorney and there are enough of them now that all have the same experience and are sharing their experiences with each other that I think they'll be successful in recouping at least some money. But worse than the money they've lost, I mean, this place has killed dreams, it's killed trust, uh, 
I feel bad for all these owners. But anyway, let's do a good walk around of this bus. I am in the airport in Phoenix. Took the shuttle down from Flagstaff to the Phoenix airport this morning. It was pretty early. It was like the 3.30 shuttle. And I am heading to San Antonio, Texas. One of the buses that was converted down there is being stored just temporarily at a local business. And I'm going to go to that local business, check out the bus, and bring it back to Arizona where we can at least volunteer the the repairs on the safety aspects, the electrical and stuff like that. So I'll shoot some video when I get there. I am driving this bus across Texas. I picked it up in San Antonio and I am taking it back to Arizona to address all the safety issues. This is another one of those conversions done in San Antonio. And let's go take a little bit of a walk around look. I just stopped here. I spent last night in Brownwood, Texas in a hotel. Uh, just stopped here so I can fix some wiring and get uh, at least the right-hand turn signals working. Sorry about the background noise. Let's go take a look. So this bus has turn signals and a headlight that work on the driver's side. But no headlight function and no turn signals on the passenger side. And of course, that would be a clue because this bundle of wires is the... Those are the wires that are connected to this, this corner module up here. So the marker light, turn signal, headlight. I'm going to splice all those together. There are no turn signals in the back either. And this might be a clue as well. So I'll crawl under here and see where those go. So these, sorry, these are those wires that were hanging down. And here are the, here's the other end of them. I don't know what the hell, chewed them up. And then that might be the headlight connector. We'll see, should be up in there. So first let me, let me splice these wires together. Which I can't do and show you, but I've got my crimp tool got some connectors. I do like to use, the connectors I like to use are called PIDG for pre-insulated diamond grip. And I couldn't find exactly those, but these look like they're pretty decent quality. They're Dorman, and so I will use them. I'm gonna strip all these wires, crimp the colors back same to same, and then see what we got. All right, I got these spliced together. So on the larger diameter wires, I was able to use the butt splice kind of as they're intended. On these smaller gauge wires, I didn't have the, the little red connectors. So what I did is I twisted them together and used these like a cap connector. So I twisted the wires in and crimped on this side and that will work for now. And then sure enough that, I said that looked like the headlight connector and if you look up in there you'll see that yeah so I'll get that plugged in and we might have headlights I have no idea how this happened but at least it's a start now to getting this fixed I was not able to snake that up there and get it plugged back in again from the back so I just pulled out these two screws sorry <laughs> pulled out these two screws for the trim ring and then took out the three of the four screws that were in place holding the headlight in place. So I'll plug that back in, screw it all back together and see if we got a headlight on this side. Well, sometimes I actually think through things after I say them out loud. So we got a headlight over here. I just put one screw in to hold it. I realized I ought to at least, before I put all the trim ring back in, make sure that that connector was on tight. So I've got a corner marker light there. I've got a headlight here. I'll put the rest of these in. It's really quite a pretty little spot to be doing some roadside repair here in Texas. So thank you, Texas. Well, that's a good sign too. So we've got a right or passenger side headlight. We got a marker light. We've got a turn signal that works up front. 
Now, this was what they classified as a high-end build. This was a $100,000 conversion. The customers paid $75,000 as a deposit, and that's all they ended up paying when they finally, after months of frustration, took their bus. But this is how it was delivered with, you know, those wires hanging down. Now, I've said this before, on a used bus, you're gonna have issues, but how do you deliver a bus without working lights? Anyway, I'm gonna crawl under here in the back and see if I can't get some turn signal on the back working too. I am under the back of the bus where those wires were hanging down, but they are not, these are not the wires you're looking for. <laughs> uh, so, these obviously go up here to the air conditioning unit and they've been pulled out, which might explain why the air conditioners don't work that were left in the bus for use. And then there's this MC cable, ah, MC cable, and then a low voltage, low voltage landscape wiring, low voltage landscape lighting wire and we'll have to figure out what that all runs to. But getting a light in the back is not going to be as easy as I thought. So this is a super cute little build, not done here in Texas. Um, you said this was done up in- Seattle. Up in Seattle. So super cute. Love the details up front. Taryn did that. But they did have the Texas place add air conditioners. And that is the mounting bracket. So Taryn's done all this staining and everything. Hello. Yeah, uh, with all the taint, like attention to detail, I've tried to do in staining and painting. And then this is the very beautiful mounting job that they did, scratching up all the ceiling getting this nice crack um, through there and all the scratches. And then you've got this big gap. That's for ventilation. Oh, yeah. that's what that is. Well, this is Taryn of Taryn and Zach, and this is their bus, which had three solar panels on it. They took it in for some additional work and had more solar panels added. And I want to show you these brackets. These are little cheesy hardware store, like angle shelf brackets. I wouldn't trust that to hold a shelf with three books on it. And then they used a self-tapping, self-drilling screw in the side of the aluminum frame. They also had left holes where apparently they changed their mind. And then the owner here, Taryn, covered that up just to keep it from leaking. But those holes were wide open. So anyway, little, I mean, look at that. You see the hole there. This is one of those little tiny 40 cent angle brackets and doesn't give good, uh, there's not a lot of resistance to pull on that. So here's one of those brackets. This is the one that was laying loose up here that apparently they decided not to use. Would you trust that to hold your solar panels on? Check that out. Isn't that nice? And here's the air conditioner in the back, or at least how it was when they grabbed their bus. They had three batteries in here, and then the San Antonio place added five more batteries. Those cables look completely appropriate. That's probably four aught. But look at the other cable sizes in comparison. And any of you that understand battery balancing and everything, with the positive and negative drawn off this end of that bank uh, and everything wired in parallel like that, these batteries aren't working as hard. There's back here looking at this, the batteries are just at 12 volts, all of them. This is the charge controller that they added and it's showing zero voltage, zero power, or zero amps coming in from the panels. 
So these are the wires running from the charge controller over to the battery bank. The only way I know that one is positive and one is negative is by checking the voltage since this end isn't marked. They did mark this end. And here's the crimp over there. So. I'm up on the roof of Zach and Taryn's bus. And these are the solar panels that were added here in Texas, down in San Antonio. And they are not getting any charge through the charge controller from these new panels. So I thought, well, let's come up here and check. So I disconnected the MC4 connectors and this one, red, is supposed to be the positive. This side then would be the negative. So let's see what we got. So black, red, and we got negative 19.8 volts. So that is the negative side, and this is the positive side. All right, now with my positive test lead over here and the negative test lead over there on the red wire, we've got 19.87 volts. So let me see if these are long enough for me to swap them. At least they were consistent in their color coding. I've removed the wires down here after reconnecting them up top. And if I put the positive probe on the black wire and the negative or black probe test lead on the red, I get positive almost 20 volts. So these are reversed down here too. At least they're consistent. Assholes. All right. We don't have any black electrical tape. So the one on the left is now positive. The one on the right is negative. And then the battery, both the blacks, one's a positive, one's a negative. Those are at least oriented right. And now they're getting charged 16 amps of charge and the voltage is already up from 12 to 12.2. Obviously that's kind of artificial just because it's, it's pushing current into the batteries right now. These batteries are not helping too much, at least with the inverter, just because of this small cable. Let me pull the cover back off again. Hey everybody, let's go through a textbook example of how not to wire a battery bank in parallel. Everything you see here is what you don't do. First off, these are four, number four uh, wires. Well, not all of them. That one looks bigger than that. This is a four, number four wire gauge, American wire gauge and obviously too small. And these batteries are connected just off one end. There's no opportunity for balance. Ideally, you go one here and negative over there, or with a bank this big, maybe in the middle, uh, like here and there, but just drawing off one end, especially with the fairly high resistance. Wow, that's really soft. The hell's that? <laughs> these look like they were bought at uh, the cheap auto parts store. Anyway, this is how you do not wire a battery bank, especially when you are adding additional battery capacity to a properly wired bank, because this bank is not going to work as hard or contribute nearly as much as that bank. And in the long run, that one will, because it's working more, it's going to fail earlier. These aren't contributing as much to the capacity of your system. Don't do this. So they've got two generator mounts back here for these two Predator generators. They're good generators. And they're supposed to sit on here and then each generator plugs into one of these boxes. But check this out. Just like the other bus, they've got 
a receptacle here instead of a recessed plug. So the only way to get power from the generator into the bus is by using another one of those so-called suicide cords. So you'd have to make a cord up. You can't buy one because they're not safe. So you've got to make up a cord that goes from the generator and it has prongs on this end that you plug in there. And if somebody does that wrong, there's a pretty good chance they could get electrocuted. And then I'm not sure what's going on with the middle one. Those three come back to this box. So let's open this up and see what's going on in there. So because they couldn't get everything in the standard box, they added this expansion. <laughs> Sorry. Because they couldn't get everything in the standard box, they added this expansion ring just to increase the volume a bit. And then they put the cover on and used self-drilling screws. The reason you don't use a self-drilling screw in an electrical box is because it can also self-drill right into the wires. Why don't you start over? And I'm gonna, Taryn's gonna tell me about, here, close that up again. Let's start from scratch here. <laughs> so. We had originally asked them for some seating area for a workstation. We needed some compartments to be able to have some of our work gear in. So I gave them measurements. Um, and this was their third attempt to give us uh, the correct measurements. When we ended up getting it, this was our final product. Nails sticking out everywhere that you can see. Uh, no bottom to it um, and still not the right dimensions. You can see their quality craftsmanship here. That's some fancy dovetail joinery. You don't you don't see that everywhere. No. That takes some skill. Mm-hmm. That's why it's sitting outside. Well. Thanks for having a good attitude about it. <laughs> I guess at this point, what else can you do? What else can you do? <laughs> the joke of Lone Star. So I stopped to get some water to drink, and as I walk out, I see something hanging down on the other side. So here is, I guess, their, their water drain. How do you hook up to that? Oh, just push that up there for now. That's stupid. And then if you're doing a $100,000 quote, high-end build for somebody, can't you spend a couple minutes with a razor blade and take off the school bus labels? Like that. And then try to keep the overspray off everything. Speaking of overspray, paint did I show you all these all the overspray on that and up here did I show you that there's only one screw holding this panel in place so that's just totally loose obviously they ran an MC cable around over to that receptacle there but couldn't be bothered to reattach that. Beautiful. When you come in, if you look up, you're greeted with this cobbled together mess where they just cut the plywood. Raw edges, just looks like hell.
we'll do sort of an overview walk around just to give you the lay of the land. This is an international FT300. It's got a Cummins, or I'm sorry, it's got a, a DT466 engine and the Alice and MD3060 transmission. They have a roof raise in the middle. Now, the customers say that is not where they wanted the roof raise cut or expected it to be cut. But anyway, that's, that's, that's a different matter. I just want to stick to the actual electrical and structural safety issues, things like that. Anyway, so this is the bus. Let's go around the other side and look at it more closely. When I picked up the bus, there was no lights over here, no corner marker light, no turn signal light, no headlight that functioned. I mean, the lights were there, but the wiring was dangling down. And I'll do a little cutaway to a video where I had to splice those together at a beautiful little Texas roadside picnic area. Anyway, the bus made it from San Antonio to Gallup, New Mexico, where the engine died, started having oil pressure loss issues, went from 80 down to 50 PSI. 50 wasn't low enough. I was concerned about that, but it was definitely not normal. So I slowed way down. I was traveling about 40 miles an hour, 40, 45 on the freeway, downshifted to fourth, keep the RPMs up. It was still getting hot. The temperature started to climb. Didn't get up to the red, but it was definitely higher than it should have been. And finally something gave in the engine and it had to be towed from Gallup, New Mexico to here. So. We'll come around here to the ladder. First off, I hate having ladders on buses, but if you're going to have a ladder, it'd be really cool if the ladder was securely attached. So those screws were busted off And then up here, they just threw some screws in at the bottom and the top of that's resting against the window. We'll climb up here in a minute. This roof raise, all this body putty in here was added by the wrap company that ground off these welds. The only reason it's even flat there is because the, the wrap company tried to salvage this a little bit. So, what these folks in San Antonio did is they cut the skin along here and then just raised it up. What they should have done is taken this rub rail off and put in new metal from here down beneath this rub rail and then put this rub rail back on. But they're too lazy to do that. So instead they've got this jagged ass cut down here. They just scabbed in a piece of metal here. So the cheapest possible way to do it. It's all bulged out. Looks like hell. The welds, I did see the welds in a previous little video segment that the owner shot before all this body putty and filler was added and the welds didn't look like they penetrated well. Anyway, I've seen first time DIY roof raise projects that looked a lot better than this. Absolutely just crap for a $100,000 build. This is the high-end build quality. So really what to make this look decent, we would take all this skin off, take this rub rail off up here, take this one off and scab in, just resheet it with one continuous piece of metal. We'll talk to the customer and see what they want done. But I think at this point, I'm encouraging them just to cut their losses. Anyway, there is a box on the side here, not secured. Here's one electrical code violation. Well, besides the box not being secured and that cover not secured, uh, this should be a WR, a weather resistant GFCI, and it's not. Clearly the electrical work on these is just 
terrible. Whoever's doing their electrical doesn't know what they're doing. I'll show you more in a bit. Kind of pisses me off. Tires here. Now, granted, date code is not the only indicator of, you know, a tire issue, but this is uh, 2015. But this checking, you see all the cracking and checking on these tires. So, not the kind of safe tire I would expect on a $100,000 high-end build. Here's the tank. <clears throat> and let's take a look under here. So this is that same kind of water heater they used in the blue bus, which is good for a half gallon a minute. It's not intended to feed multiple fixtures. It can't provide enough hot water to even give you a decent shower. Uh, you could probably wash your hands with it and that's about it. It's not designed to be installed in a wet location, which this is under here. And in fact, this MC cable is also not approved for wet locations. And having exposed connections like that, I mean, look at that. You just got a wire nut hanging out and a crimp connector here, and I can see the copper in there. The only reason I'm even comfortable touching this is because I know that it's turned off electrically. Anyway, Really shoddy work under here. That MC cable's not well supported. And then that black wire is low voltage landscape lighting wire, which is what they're using for the pump. Might be suitable, maybe. But anyway, uh, that's just all got to go. All right, let's work our way around the back here. We're going to come back to that. So this was apparently welded up here at one point, but that's just sheet metal. Obviously, they ground it off. I don't know if you can see they, they ground it off and then hit it with some spray paint. This is the generator rack. And you can tell over here where they, I don't know, piled up weld in there. This is also just sheet metal. And so it's already bowed that out just with the weight of the generator on the back. We'll come in the back here in a minute. Signal lights on the right are not working. I was not able to get them working on the trip. Isn't that beautiful? And again, this was this was added by the wrap company trying to make it at least something they could they could wrap, but they just couldn't. No way. You can beat it in with a hammer here. It's like they hit it, like used a chisel or a screwdriver just to pound that in flat. I don't know if you can see how bulged out that is. Seriously, I've never seen a first time DIY roof raise that looked this bad. Let's go up top. Just want to show you the brackets for the roof rack up here. We've got six panels, wires just laying loose. They're using just self-drilling screws into the sheet metal. Oh, sorry. They're using self-drilling screws into the sheet metal, and I'm not quite sure what kind of an adhesive that is. Obviously not safe. Those are gonna chafe, like where that, uh, 
sorry, trying to crawl. Like right here, those wires are going to chafe against the edge of this bracket. Anyway, we'll fix all that. Yeah, it's starting to snow here in Arizona. It snows here a lot. Let's come inside. You can see what a $100,000 high-end build from this place looks like. Oh, yeah, that exposed uh, trim in there. That, that's what fit in there, <laughs> just sitting there loose. Unpainted raw edge on the floor here, and the flooring's just coming up. So they just hit this with a brush and like a latex house paint, except where they sprayed things. So they have overspray all over the overspray all over the seat belt. They did put a seat cover on it for a hundred grand. Overspray all over the dash. Customer asked for storage up above the windshield. You know how important storage is if you're living in or traveling in your RV. And they got this little rack. You could maybe put your Beanie Baby collection in there. Just showing you some of the detail work. They left all the air conditioning units in here, even though they're non-functional. There's one wheel well. Now, there's another wheel well under here. Obviously, it doesn't take up all that space. The customer asked for this platform for an IKEA little futon sofa thing that would fit there, and they wanted storage underneath it. And there might be, well, there certainly is room under there, but there's no accessible storage. That is just all cobbled together. Refrigerator that the customer supplied. Very nice sink that the customer supplied. This San Antonio place is consistent with their refrigerator attachment mechanism. They've got a D-ring here and a D-ring over here. And that ratchet strap that I had to use to close the door is what was wrapped around the fridge to hold it in place. This is looks like a junior high shop class project. Not sure what you're supposed to be able to stack in there. You know, usually something like this would be set up with multiple shelves for cans. I don't know if the video even shows how cobbled together this is. So you got one shelf here and then one shelf way down there for your really tall cans. Over here you've got an unfinished wood countertop. Still has the burn marks in here from where they cut it. Let me. So this is just raw, raw edge plywood there. Check out these drawers. Just, I don't know if you can see how, that's just raw plywood. And of course, this is where a drawer is most stressed. So you would use a dovetail or some kind of a notch lap joint. There are other mechanisms, even if you don't want to do fancy dovetails that are better than just nailing in that way. At the very least, 
overlap the side and nail that way and glue it and screw it or nail it together but that's not going to last very long obviously it isn't already oh by the way they did this in the other build too you see where that galvanized fits into that brass fitting? There's supposed to be a dielectric fitting wherever the, the metals, you know, you got dissimilar metals. And I have no idea why they used galvanized little nipples there, but there should be a, a dielectric fitting so that you don't have the steel in contact with the, the brass there. And they use P-traps, and I guess... You know, I was maybe a little harsh in my other video where I said they shouldn't be used in an RV. And they do use them in RVs, but they are prone to sloshing out. And so I do prefer the HEPVO valves. HEPVO. And then this was in place down here until during the drive when it popped out. Obviously, it wasn't adhered. Well, let's come into the back. So they did a roof raise, but then they raised the floor, sort of defeats the purpose. There is a barn door that goes over here, but you have to take the barn door off because when you're traveling, it slides off the end. Now, the bathroom was finished, the floor was finished, but the flooring didn't adhere. And the customers, after they picked up the bus and found out there were leaks, had to have a plumber come in and the plumber cut up the floor so he could evaluate what was going on under here and give them an estimate on repairing it. So they've got a separate toilet, really nice toilet. And the solids go into the back there. And then this is for the urine diverter. The toilet was not even attached, just sitting on the ground with this piece of pipe up here and that big piece of pipe. So that pipe came over here and then went down through the floor. That was the vent that they just tacked on and the toilet was loose. And if the customer had used the toilet, the urine comes out that pipe there. That's the urine pipe. So had the customer used the toilet, it would have just run out onto the floor. And then this is for the vent fan box was not even attached just sitting in there what's the saying a little cock a little paint makes you the tile person you ain't just rough edges in here on the tile And that's all bulged up because the P-trap on the bottom is butted up against the floor. There was a washer and dryer in here. They had to take that out to get access to the floor and the plumbing. Now, I took this trim piece off so I could look down inside the wall and see what kind of insulation was in there. I used my little camera. Here is a fold down or a pull down Murphy bed. And that's the barn door that goes here. But again, it comes off the track when you're driving. Watch your head. And we get around here to the electrical. get around here to the electrical so this little piece of plexiglass was just sitting here that might have been their attempt to provide a protective cover for those live hot terminals on top of the battery if anything metal had fallen on those that could arc across the terminals of the battery and if the battery management system didn't protect it uh, 
then it could overheat and cause a fire. Beautiful paint. So they painted over wires up here. I'll have to figure out which of those go to the lights in the back. So you've got a Renergy inverter charger that actually came out of another bus and was sold to this customer. I think that's a 200 amp hour battery. I'll have to pull that out. Should be easy to pull out because they're not attached. In fact, the 12 volt system quit working during the drive because this battery and the inverter both slid over and ripped the wires out of the terminal connectors here, the ring terminals. So they've got a transfer switch with an open knockout on top, a code violation. They don't have any fuse on the battery there. And this is where I really start to get pissed at these folks because there are so many electrical hazards in here. They didn't even try. There are things done here that a first week apprentice gopher or wire puller would not do. So whoever is doing the electrical work is clearly not a trained or licensed electrician. So they've got MC cable here, flex, and that's not the right kind of connector for it. And even if it was, it's missing the outer ring the compression ring that goes on the top here and threads on there. So this would be for, you know, some kind of a, it's a, a connector for some kind of like SO cable or something like that, something soft. And then this one's obviously not even attached. I don't know why the cover's open there. This is not an MC connector. That's for, you know, EMT you know, electrical me metallic tubing. Down here, they've got a cable clamp connector and the knockout is too big for this thing to even attach in there. I mean, they didn't even try. And then here there is no protection or anything through that knockout, so that's going to chafe. And then when it gets up into the box, again, no connector up here. So that's just going to chafe at some point against the sharp edge of this knockout opening. The only reason I'm touching this box is because everything is dead. There's nothing uh, hot in here, which is good because this panel is not safe. Now in the other bus, you'll remember that we had 30 amp breakers with 12 gauge wire. These are 14 gauge. That's a 14 gauge wire on a 20 amp circuit. 14 gauge wire is suitable up to 15 amp circuits. In fact, they hardly use it in houses anymore. Almost everything's gone to 12 gauge wire and 20 amp. Here you've got a 30 amp breaker with a 14 gauge wire. Let's take a look at the electrical code. Let's take a look. I can guarantee you that these guys in San Antonio don't have any of these books. This is the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association standard for RVs. This is the RVIA and American National Standards Institute book, Low Voltage Systems for Conversion and Recreational Vehicles. And they basically refer to the NEC. So if we go here, grab the reading glasses. Article 240, overcurrent protection conductors shall not exceed that required down here. So, 14 gauge copper, 15 amps maximum overcurrent protection. That would be a fuse or breaker. What did they have in there? They had a 20 amp, they had a 30 amp. 12 gauge, 
we're going to skip that. 12 gauge copper, 20 amps. And then 10 gauge is 10 gauge copper, good for up to 30 amps. So obviously they need one of these. So anyway, this 20 amp breaker on a 14 gauge wire is a code violation and a fire and electrical hazard. 30 amp breaker with a 14 gauge wire is a code violation and a fire and electrical hazard. Here you got a 15 amp breaker, another 15 amp breaker. This might be number number 10, so that would be okay for 20 amp. And then you got a breaker here with nothing on it. Check this out. This is the inverter. Can you see how crooked that is? What a cobbled together cut. And it obviously was never even mounted. There are no holes in there where the screws should have been. But you want to see the worst part? Let's go outside. Remember I told you we'd come back to this? Well, this is the generator rack. And that's the cable that these idiots in San Antonio provided to the customer. Do me a favor, pause the video right now and do a Google or internet search for suicide cable. If you look up suicide cable or Widowmaker cable, you're going to see a description of this. So this end plugs into the generator to get power from the generator to the bus, this, which would be for incoming power, should be a recessed plug with prongs. Instead, because they used a receptacle here, which is illegal to use in this context, the only way to get power from this end of the cord, which goes into the generator, into the bus is to use what's colloquially known, that's hard to say, commonly known as a suicide cable, widowmaker cable, death cord, any of those things. If you look them up, you'll see this. You cannot buy one of these because they're not safe. Nobody sells these because they're not safe. So what they did is they took a pigtail cord and they added a plug onto the other end. First off, they didn't even install the plug correctly because you've got the interior uh, conductors underneath this outer jacket exposed. And then, I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna bend this up. Can you see the copper in there? Where they cut the insulation? So that black wire is the hot, so is the red. Those would be uh, the two lines coming in. So they cut every single one of those that I can see. Sorry. So they cut every single one. I can see I can see copper in there on the white. I can see copper in the black. I can see copper in there on the green. So this jacket should be up inside this plug. But first off, you shouldn't have a plug like this. This is absolutely unsafe. Somebody's going to die. So this is why I'm just so pissed at these assholes down there. So I've now seen two different buses with this kind of interface provided by that outfit in San Antonio. A combination of three of these cords, because one of the buses had two on the back. Any outfit that is doing the kind of electrical work you'd see on the other side of this panel, which by the way, doesn't that look just beautiful for your $100,000 build? Looking in and seeing the bare back of the panel here through the window or over here just totally unpainted I don't know if you can see that but this pisses me off because this is absolutely dangerous somebody could kill themselves because these jerks in San Antonio force the customer in fact they give the customer this cable as a way to get power from the generator into their bus these folks 
I, I got a message for you. Put down your Bob the Builder electrician playset and just stop doing electrical work until, I mean, before you kill somebody. You've got just wires unsecured. They're going to get trapped. Oh, Christ. Sorry. Sorry, this stuff just pisses me off. So they've got wires unsecured, the wrong kind of wire, the wrong size wire. They're using wire in wet locations that isn't rated for wet locations. They're giving customers things that are so dangerous that you can look them up under suicide cable and find a perfect example. So just stop, people. Stop doing electrical 